What is going on, everyone? Jonathan with the Venue RX podcast. And today I have a special guest. I'm joined today by Leah Weinberg. She is the author of an incredible book that was just released. She has so many different things that she works on. I'm going to introduce her right away and let her tell you all about them. Leah, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here today. I'm excited to have you. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is something that is very impactful for everyone in our industry. I think there's a lot that our venue listeners can can learn from, our planners certainly, and other vendors as well. And I'm just coming off of attending Wedding MBA 2021 out in Vegas. Uh, I know we were just talking; you weren't you weren't there because of schedule conflicts. But um, this is definitely a topic that is that is impactful and something I. I keep hearing about. So I'm, I'm glad to be talking about what we are talking about. I'm kind of teasing it a little bit. Um, <laughs> but before we get to that, tell us who you are, tell us about your company and tell us about the book you just released. Yeah. So I own color pop events, which is a event planning company based in New York city. I do primarily focus on weddings, but do some kind of corporate and nonprofit stuff here and there. I've been in business for a little over eight years. And prior to doing this, I was a commercial real estate attorney for a decade. Um, which also gives me a lot of insight um, and kind of attention to detail when it comes to the topic that we're talking about today. And earlier this year, I published The Wedding Roller Coaster, which is a book that I wrote for engaged couples to help them navigate the emotional side of wedding planning, um, how to kind of maintain their own mental health, practice self-care, and just keep healthy relationships with everybody around them during the wedding planning process, because that's not always the case. And I've also found the book is really helpful for vendors too, because if you're not a planner, you probably don't get a lot of insight into what clients are going through during the wedding planning process. So this is something that's really going to sort of, you know, give a peek behind the curtain and give them a lot of more information on what their clients are going through. That is really insightful. And it's something I don't, I wouldn't have thought of just being in the wedding industry, but you're totally right. You know, it's so much more than booking vendors or, you know, everything, all the, the pieces of it, the nuts and bolts, there is a huge mental and emotional impact and all of the relationships. I mean, sometimes there are relationships that haven't really been reopened, right? Or there are relationships that are getting reopened. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Like what are some of these relationships that you're helping? helping? Yeah. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's re honestly relationships with everybody. So it's the kind of relationship that you yourself, you have with yourself as the person planning the wedding, kind of digging deep into like what marriage means to you and dealing with past relationship baggage. If there is some dealing with family, issues, obviously the relationship with the person's partner, the two people or multiple people, the people getting married, their relationship with each other and just kind of getting on the same page as to what this wedding represents, what they want it to feel like. Big one is obviously a relationship with family. Um, sometimes you have close relationships. Sometimes you have kind of neutral relationships. Sometimes there's very strained relationships and how to just approach that and kind of saying sometimes it's okay if that relationship isn't there. And sometimes the wedding is not the time to try to repair something if it doesn't feel right for you. Um, it also goes into relationships with the wedding party. And then there's some really fun stuff on like guests behaving badly. So there's like, that's the juicy story part of the book. Um, but yeah, there's, it's so much the, the world of people of somebody getting married is so much bigger than just the people who are going through the wedding. And it touches on a lot of different relationships and a lot of different people. And we don't talk a lot about all of these different relationships and how to kind of maintain them in a healthy way throughout the planning process. So it's something that I felt really passionate about writing and diving into. I love it. I love it. Well, your experience as a wedding planner, I, I think perfectly lends itself because you are with couples during a lot of those different pieces and you are, you know, you've had a very important role. Um, it is available on Amazon. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So pretty easy for everyone to pick up, definitely go and, and check it out. Leah has created uh, an amazing resource there for couples, as well as uh, maybe some empathy reading for those of us who are in the industry. Yes. Um, I love your website as well. And I have to plug it really quick because, you know, it's color pop events and it's just so it does pop. It I love it. I love your branding. I love what you've done 
uh, with the site. And so it's, it's very, very cool. Huge, huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I took, so 2020 was the year that I took to kind of finish the book and also completely revamp the website, get a new logo and all that stuff. So that's my, what I'm calling my COVID silver lining. I love it. I love it. And those, those are real things. COVID did bring uh, plenty of silver linings. What you mentioned that you were finishing the book in 2020, was there something specific that inspired you to write the book in 2018 or 2019 leading up to this time? Because certainly COVID has been very challenging. I think maybe more challenging than even normal, but what, were there things that happened in 18 and 19 that kind of for you really inspired you to start this book? Yeah. So writing a book has always been something I've wanted to do. It was really just a matter of figuring out what the topic was going to be. And this, the book was honestly inspired by a single conversation that I had in 2017 with one of my clients. I tell, I go into detail on this in the story, on the story in the book, but um, one of my clients was having a fight with her dad and they were like not speaking, which was very unusual for them. And in the moment I kind of helped her break down and understand what was really going on because the thing that they were fighting about wasn't the actual like heart of the conflict. And so after I had that conversation with her, I started thinking about all the things that I've seen, the conversations that I've had as a wedding planner and wanted to really understand the psychology behind it. So I would say probably 2018, 2019, I slowly started putting pen to paper, read psychology books, uh, spoke to different experts in different fields. And then 2020 was when I just kind of had finally had that time and space to get the majority of it done. But it's been something that's been in the was in the works for several years. I love it. I love it. Well, everyone will have to go check that book out. I know I'm going to be checking it out as well. So um, thank you for that, seriously, because any resources for this industry that help elevate this industry, I have become so thankful for as I have dived deeper into this. And yeah. so, yeah, well, let's move to the topic of today's podcast. Um, I, I think so many of us in this industry feel overwhelmed at times, certainly because we are constantly working in our businesses, not on our business. And that's kind of this, this, you know, tagline, this phrase that that we've heard before, but it does seem very, very difficult to pluck ourselves out of the day-to-day things that we know we need to do to kind of keep the business running. And then the stuff that we need to do at macro to actually move our company forward and maybe accomplish some of those things. And I know you know, you writing a book is a testament to the fact that maybe you have done some automations and you have mastered some of those things that um, is challenging to many people. So let's talk about automation. Let's talk about kind of getting out of just barely breathing. And certainly in October and November for so many people in 2021, that's like, that's like what's been happening. Um, are there some just high level top tips and top things that, that you use that we can start this conversation on? Yeah, I think the first thing is it takes some reflection. So taking a look at your business. And again, you made a good point. Like people are just surviving right now. So a lot of the stuff we're talking about are things that like, you know, people are going to need a couple months to recover before they start really implementing these, um, these steps. But the big thing is taking a look at your business from a high level perspective and seeing what tasks you do over and over again, whether it's invoicing, whether it's client communication, con like sending out contracts, what your onboarding process looks like, what offboarding looks like. And you shouldn't, the idea is you should not be reinventing the wheel every time you're doing this. There has to be some kind of system and process in place. And when I talk, when I personally use the word automation, I'm sometimes talking about making things automatic. Like you don't, don't have to remember to do them. And then other ways it's about just sort of making it like an automated, like a process and a system where yes, maybe you do have to send an email or press a button, but it's still a workflow that's in place. So I think the big thing is for people to take a look at their business and see what the flow is and what things they're doing over and over again. And within each thing, creating a system and process for doing those things. Okay. Awesome. I was going to ask you, is it, do you have any tips for, um, practical tips for where people should 
go maybe to do this or like kind of the like is this something that you should can just do in the morning some random day over coffee um is there a special way that you can get into the mindset of this because for a lot of us it's it's just a, it's a mindset switch i mean we're talking about going high level versus the day-to-day -day stuff but it's sometimes extremely hard to block out everything yes. that's going on the emails the calls like every the texts right yes Although we should talk about texting because I have very strong opinions on that well, let's do it. Uh, when let's it do comes it. to clients. But <laughs> yeah, I think I think right now, um, you know, depending on the timing of when this particular episode is being released, but the time of sort of as people are finishing up their 2021 weddings and before they're starting to jump into 2022, it's that kind of break that is the perfect time to start thinking about these things because you can block off the time because hopefully we're all giving ourselves a little bit, if possible, time off between getting, you know, finishing this wedding season, getting ramped up for the next one. And you're right. You do. You have to have a kind of a quiet, clear minded sit down in order to do this. Now, I think it can be done in steps because trying to tackle everything at once is, is just a lot. But I think for that first sort of sit down session that somebody has, it's about just like I said, high level identifying the different steps and processes and pieces that are part of your whole business's workflow. And then in separate sessions, that's when you kind of address each piece. So like, let's say we're looking at a business. First thing that comes to mind for me is like how somebody handles their inquiries. So whether that's they have like a template response, whether they have kind of an auto responder that responds to all the inquiries. So it's like you've got your inquiry. That's definitely part one. Then it's once somebody wants to book you, the next phase is, you know, contract. And how does that get sent out? And how are you doing the contract each time? And then once you book somebody, it's uh, collecting the retainer and what the onboarding process looks like. And then depending on your particular vendor category, it's like what happens, and this is aside from planners, but like what happens between booking and like however many months out from the wedding before you start talking about scheduling. So that first session should just be kind of identifying those different pieces. And then the subsequent sit downs should be, okay, let me take a hard look at my inquiry process. How am I tracking things? How am I responding to leads? How am I following up with leads if they don't respond to an initial email? Because if you try to do the whole thing in one sitting, you're going to your mind's going to explode because you're going to overwhelm yourself. So it's about kind of identifying the whole thing and then breaking it up into manageable pieces. That's huge. I just even thinking about this, I can imagine the overwhelm that could happen because, you know, I'm sure that people realize, my goodness, there's so much. And I know that's, you know, one thing at wedding MBA and any of these industry events. And then even our conversation and, you know, listening to podcasts and just the other incredible educators that are in our industry, you hear all this stuff. It's like marketing sales, you know, my follow-ups, everything that's going on. And it's easy to feel like, Oh, we're really dropping the ball here. And so to get overwhelmed and then just to stop and not do anything. So if I'm hearing you correctly, your advice is to just take the, the big, massive, scary goal, divide it up into these little chunks and then just handle one chunk at a time. Is that, is that yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Awesome. When you are thinking about automation, I know you made the distinction between, you know, like autoresponders and things like that. Do you feel like there is a place where automation kind of gets to be too much? where we can get too many gizmos and gadgets to help us respond and we lose some of the humanity for you. What is that line? So I, I would say that I have very little that is fully automatic. That's like not a sort of personal response or touch point for me, but that's because of how my business is set up. I mean, ideally I'm doing anywhere from like maybe 15 or less weddings a year. So that makes it a lot more practical for me to be very hands-on with clients and very, um, you know, personal if you've got somebody who's a DJ, especially if it's like a DJ who owns the company and then has a bunch of different associates, they're doing hundreds of weddings. So they can't, they're, for them, having something actually automatic could be helpful because they just don't 
physically have the time to just be like reaching out to people individually. So for me, it's definitely, I'm definitely very high touch, but realizing that that doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So it's a very personal decision. And again, that kind of goes back to taking the time to do that high level analysis to figure out what makes sense. I will say, I think people, if people are considering doing something like an autoresponder, let's say they want to do an autoresponder for inquiries, I think it's wise to kind of do like a B testing in that situation because you want to see how people respond to it. I've definitely heard from some people that they really don't like autoresponders in certain situations and other people are kind of fine with it because it gives them like that base level information they were reaching out for. So it's definitely something I think people can play around with and experiment with just to see like what is going to be, what's the best way for you to do, do it with your business. That makes sense. You know, I noticed as I was looking at your website that, um, you know, you said that there are a couple of different places that you generally start working with your clients. And for all of my planner friends out there and anyone, you know, who's listening to this or watching it on YouTube, um, by the way, for anyone who is listening on the podcast, you have to check out the YouTube because Leah is wearing a very incredible, is this a shirt? Is this a jacket? It's a what? sweatshirt with sprinkles on it. Okay. I am, so, it is really incredible. If you, if you guys aren't watching on YouTube, you're really, really, really missing out. It's a whole vibe. Um, but anyways, on to your business. Um, you, you make a distinction between the three different places that you generally start working with folks. And then you say, you know, you're not going to find any day of or month of coordination or packages or anything like that here. Why do you not uh, offer those services? Oh, for me, it's just been a conscious decision of like, how I like to work with my clients. So I'm very big on relationship building, which is reflected in like why I wrote the book and the kind of way that I just approach working with couples. And I have found that working with starting later on in the process, number one, they've booked everything already. And like, I am still for lack of a better word, sort of stuck with the decisions that they've made. And sometimes I'm left to kind of clean up things that they might've done decisions that they might've made that were not fantastic. Um, and so it just leaves less time to like build trust and build a relationship and like get them to have confidence in me and my ability when things start that short of, from a, like short of a period of time. Um, so I like to work with clients, like from the very beginning. And yes, that means that I'm sometimes working with people for a year, year and a half, like two years out, which is a really long relationship, but that's, that's like my superpower. That's what I love to do. It's like working with people to build relationships. I want to make sure that they're working with vendors and booking venues that I know and trust, helping them make smart decisions with their money. I can't tell you how many people who have either inquired with me or even who have booked and they booked a particular venue. And then it turns out that the budget that they thought that they had initially intended, like, is just not going to work with that space because they didn't understand all the things that came along with it. So I'm very, I like to take that educational role, that sort of guide to take them through the planning process rather than, okay, they've already spent six months booking everything. They're super stressed. And then I jump in and it's like, wow, you haven't enjoyed the wedding planning process. And now I'm coming in in the middle of like, just a lot of like hectic energy. So I like to like, try to keep them calm and organized from the beginning. For anyone who's a planner who just heard that and would aspire to that and maybe really wishes that they had more opportunity maybe to connect with, with their clients, but are a little concerned about the difference in price. Right. You know, um, that's, it's a whole kind of business elevation. And really that's what we're talking about. I mean, going from 15, 20 weddings, if you're doing 30 or 40 or 50 weddings, the difference in workflow, the difference in automation that's necessary. I mean, you yes. just spoke to it with the DJs. Um, are there some steps that people can take to start moving in that direction if they are aspiring to doing, I don't want to say quality, not quantity, but just really deepening those relationships and having the actual time to do that. Yeah. And also, I mean, I just want to throw out there that everybody's different. Cause I know I have a lot of planner friends that like, just like to do the coordination piece and they 
they love it. They're like, great. I don't have to talk to you until six weeks out before your wedding. Like, this is what I like to do. Um, and they're great at it. And, but again, it's a volume thing. So like, they're obviously doing more of those in order to like have the same level of income, but yeah, it take number one. I think we have to just remind ourselves that it takes time. I mean, I've been in business for a little over eight years and I'm sort of like, finally finding like a good stride in terms of like making the money that I want to make, booking the clients that I want, like booking them from the beginning of the planning process. And so it's just kind of about sticking, sticking with it. And if that's what you want to do, number one, start telling people. So tell the venues that you're working with, like, Hey, I would love to start working with some of your clients, like right after they book you, if they need a planner. So please think of me, if somebody's looking, um, telling other friends, like photographers and caterers get booked pretty early in the process. So telling them that like, you want to start working with couples more like partial to full planning. And once you put it out there and start telling people what you want, making sure that your messaging is consistent with that, like what you're putting out on social media and, um, on your website, it's just gonna, it's gonna slowly happen for you. I mean, one thing, honestly, that, um, I started noticing when couples were leaving me reviews from early on, when I knew that I wanted to make that shift, I asked them not to use the word like coordination or coordinator. If they were leaving a review, obviously you have to have a good enough rapport to like ask somebody uh, like how to leave you a review. Um, but consider that, like, if you have somebody that had a great experience and maybe you did month of coordination, maybe just ask them to use the word planning because mm -hmm. then it's like, then people, as they read reviews, aren't seeing the word coordination and you kind of are able to transition out of that. That's a great practical tip because people do book so often off of the stuff that they see in reviews. And it's like, Oh, you know, Sally S said that, you know, she really enjoyed the blank that you did. And so if there's constantly that like coordination, 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 or I hired her for my day of or month of, you're going to keep getting the same, yeah. the same stuff. It's kind of that review that is, um, perpetuating the same type of business. So that that's a great practical tip. Yeah. Um, your, we're talking here about, you know, automation, leveling up your business. I, I really feel like your genius and what you, you know, talk about in the book really comes back to the interpersonal relationship and the empathy. I think that, that you have, that you have to have right for the couples. Um, can you share a little bit with how you, how you get there? Because so many people in our industry, they do wedding after wedding after wedding. And even people who have, in fact, I would argue maybe people who are longer in the industry, it's easy to get jaded. Yeah. <laughs> and so how do you stay fresh? How do you stay empathetic? And how do you kind of use that as your superpower to help continue serving new couples? Yeah, I want to say, I do want to acknowledge that this year has been hard for everybody. And so if you're feeling like we're all probably really jaded, we're really exhausted at this point. So like stuff we're talking about, again, not necessarily things you're going to implement right away. Um, yeah, pause it. Pause it to, and then come yes, back. <laughs> we, we have to rest and recharge for 2022 before we can do some of those things. Um, but yeah, you... Number one, it's kind of about having a lot of self-awareness. So understanding what you're good at. So not everybody's great at um, connect. Not everybody's great at connecting with people. Not everybody wants to really emotionally connect with people. So I think having that self-awareness to understand like what your level of emotional intelligence is, what your emotional style is, what you're comfortable with, because what we don't want to do is encourage you to sort of like try to really bond with somebody in an uncomfortable or unnatural way for you, because then it's just going to number one, you're probably not going to enjoy it. You might come off weird and awkward to whoever it is. So know your strengths and weaknesses, number one, and that, and just figure out what feels good for you. And another big thing is this connection piece and creating touch points during the planning process. Like one of my big pet peeves is that so many vendors, and I see this because I'm a planner, so many vendors, they'll book the client at the beginning and then just not 
have any touch points until about two months out from the wedding when we start talking about like scheduling and details and stuff. And I'm constantly getting emails or questions from clients that are like, oh, we haven't heard from our DJ in nine months. Should we be worried? Is everything okay? Is that normal? And when you take a minute to look at how they're phrasing that question, it's like fear-based. And so the last thing that you as a vendor want to be doing is like instilling any kind of like fear or worry in your clients. And so I'm trying to get people to get creative and figure out how to create connection points during the planning process. And again, if you are super high volume, then we've got to find something that's going to be manageable for you. So that might just be like, could just be something as simple as an email six months out. And this can be all like automated or you create it as a system and like get a calendar reminder, but like six months out, you know, congratulations, you're six months away. Hope you're doing well. If you need anything, let us know. Otherwise we'll be back in touch with you in four months. Something as simple as that. Um, if you have a lower volume business where it makes sense Find a time to go out to lunch with them, take them out for drinks, go out to dinner. Um, if you, one of the things I've said, if you're a florist, like, and the couple super into flowers, take them to the flower market just to like show them around, show them how you're going to like pick out the flowers, what it's like the week of their wedding, um, just to give them a sense. Like they'd probably really love that. If you're a caterer or um, a baker, have them in for like a mini tasting, that kind of thing. Just find ways to touch base with them, check in, reassure them that you're still alive in some cases. Um, but it's going to go a long way because I will say like not a lot of people are doing that. And so you can really stand out if that's something you just incorporate into the workflow of your business. Leah, that's a great tip. Um, you're saying this and I'm, and I'm thinking of the venues that I know we work at. I'm thinking of a lot of the different people that, that, I've talked to in the industry and yeah, it's weird. It's a weird thing. Like a wedding, you've got this time where it's this very extremely important day that people are spending a lot of money on. And then they book a vendor, certainly the venue, certainly the cater, some of these like you know, main vendors that get booked very early on. And then they don't hear from them for a while, but they've just put a 30% deposit down or a 50% deposit down or 25% or whatever it happens to be. And so now it's like, you have my money. I feel like we're working together, but we're not really working together yet because services are rendered on the day of the event. And it's like this big commitment, but then there's no communication. Yeah. So I love that. I have a question though, going inversely, Mm -hmm. Would it be, let's say you do have a high volume business. Anyone who's listening or watching this right now, you do have a high volume business. You're serving hundreds of couples. Is it fair to say that you could even alleviate some of this fear-based response of like, I haven't heard from this vendor in a while by explaining to them up front that like you're going to book and then we're not going to talk for a little while, but have no fear we're here kind of thing? Yes. A hundred percent. Setting expectations up front is a great way to just sort of like take care of that from the beginning. If you don't have that time to do the high, if you, if you have the high volume and don't have the time to do something individually. Also, one thing that occurred to me, and this came up with, um, at a recent conference I was at, I spoke to somebody who's with a venue and what they said, which was really helpful was they'll do sort of like open houses and actually invite the, their existing couples as well to come in and just like see the space, grab a bite to eat or grab a drink or something like that. Because one of the things I hear a lot too, from my couples from when they book to like when we go for like either a midpoint walkthrough or the final walkthrough, they're like, wow, we, I, we haven't been here in forever. I forgot what it looked like, or like, I forgot how big it is, or I forgot how cozy it is. And so I thought that was genius was just finding a way to like have people come in. Um, and honestly, the same thing too, could potent depending on what type of vendor you are and what you want to do. And if this feels comfortable to you, but like maybe have an open house type event somewhere where you can have all your clients come um, and just hang out. Like if it makes me think like if you're a DJ or a band, like a showcase type thing where they can come in and listen to the music, um, 
meet other couples. Couples love to sort of like commiserate and have companionship with each other. So it can be a great way for them to kind of just meet each other. We're coming up on the holidays. So like having a holiday get together like that is something that can be really helpful. But yeah, I totally, I am not here to tell anybody to add work to their plate that they just can't handle. It's about figuring out, you know, taking these ideas of what we're recommending people do and making it work for your business. Like that's key. Like, I don't want you to waste money that you don't have. I don't want you to waste time that you don't have. I don't want you to throw a holiday party if you hate entertaining, like, but figure out what's comfortable for you and what makes sense in your business and then try to incorporate that. I love that. Leah, let's go practical really quick. Not that any of this isn't been practical, but let's say you have someone who's listening to this right now or watching, right? And they're, they're saying, oh my goodness, this, this sounds great. And they're inspired, but they're thinking back and they're, they're like, wow, the couples that I currently have, I don't have that relationship with Mm -hmm. the couples that I have right now. They're not really, I don't feel like they're interested in getting to know me. I don't know if I'm interested in getting to know them, you know, to that level, we've kind of had this business exchange so far. Um, and it doesn't feel it almost kind of feels weird. Like we're taking this from a professional relationship to more of a personal relationship. I know you mentioned getting the drinks and I certainly know photographers and and planners and people who work very closely with their clients who do have that personal relationship with them where they feel completely comfortable doing that. But for anyone who's not in that position currently and listening to this, who wants to get there, are there a couple of kind of light, high level steps that they can take to kind of start baby stepping some of their current existing clients into this sort of thing? Yeah. And I think you, well, you have to be realistic because if some of your existing clients are like a lost cause there's, and the relationship is fine. I don't know that it's necessary to like spend the time and effort to like build a new relationship with them. But I do think just even checking in with those people via email, just to say, Hey, I'm here. I'm thinking about you. Like, let me know if there's anything you need, or like, we're looking forward to your day. Just that kind of small thing can just be really helpful just to check in. But then going forward, it's about figuring out what kind of process is going to be comfortable for you and practical for you. So, you know, think about like what your onboarding process looks like with a new client, depending on who you are, you know, maybe it makes sense to, if you want to get into this relationship building, maybe it makes sense to like, send them, um, an onboarding gift, maybe kind of getting together in part, like with zoom and everything, I feel like everybody's just getting so much more comfortable, not seeing each other in person, but maybe it's something where like after booking, you go like for a congratulatory, like meal or drink just to get to know them better and touch base. Um, there's definitely ways to kind of set the foundation for relationship building from early on. But I think you've got to just take a look at like what your process is and what makes sense for you um, and implement that. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. The thing that I hear you saying repeatedly, and I think this is key. It's something I'm certainly taking away is that doing what's right for you and doing what's right for your business. Um, And you mentioned self-awareness is there for those of us who aren't as in touch with ourselves as maybe we should be, are there some, some things that we can do? Um, I don't know, personality tests, um, asking a friend, like, are there some things that you've done in your experience that have kind of helped inform you about what is going to work? Yes. I have a really good exercise for this. Um, and the, the background of this story is like when people hear my company name, color pop events, they assume that like, I'm always working with like couples that are really creative that want so much color everywhere that are just like really bold. And at some point in my business, I realized that wasn't actually the case. Like I wasn't, sometimes I would get couples that would inquire and they would say, we're not really big into color. Does that matter? Like, can you still work with us? And I'm like, I can plan anything you want. It's like, I just happen to be drawn to like color. And so I will get those types of clients, but I was like, so I'm not. So the obvious thing was I'm not getting like super colorful clients. So let's figure out, you know, what sort of my superpowers are. And I was working with a coach and had, she had me do this exercise where you email 20 to 30, like close friends, potentially family members, if you've got like a good relationship with them. And you ask these people to list three words that describe you. 
And through that exercise, you can see how others, how you're coming off to others, how others perceive you, what they think sort of your strengths are. And the things that came out for me in that exercise was a lot of things like loyalty, honesty, good communication, um, and traits like that. And so with that information, I realized this is interesting because I do, I notice that like, I tend to work with a lot of people who are like lawyers, doctors, people in finance. And I think like my professional background as a lawyer, the way that I'm interacting with people makes, they appreciate sort of my approach. And so, and then that also helps me like get into this idea of like strong on relationship building. Mm -hmm. And so it's so helpful because sometimes we can get stuck and we think that we know what our brand and our us as people are attracting. But when you get this outside input, I think the results can be really fascinating. That is fascinating. And what you're touching on really is being, being you, being authentic to who you are, even before, you know, maybe when you started your business, you know, you had a corporate background. I know some of the, the people that I've talked to, the guests that have been on this show, have incredible corporate backgrounds. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, Bethel, uh, Bethel mm-hmm. Nathan, who is an officiant, and she has this, you know, whole entire past life <laughs> almost with on Wall Street and mm-hmm. in different countries. And taking that and kind of providing that approach, just like you were saying, makes a huge difference. What if you want to do a reset though? Do you have any tips for that? Like if you feel like you would prefer to work with only the events yeah. that are super colorful or or the other way, right? Are there things that you can do to kind of get yourself more comfortable with serving a certain type of event that you can kind of like, I don't want to say rebrand, but yeah, almost rebrand. And maybe it's something like you were in corporate before, but you don't want to go back there. So you want to be like radically different. Are there anything, any things that you can suggest to kind of help people start getting there? Yeah. I, I mean, first you just have to communicate it. So I'm communication comes up a lot for me. I'm an over communicator, big believer in like the power of communication. And so it's kind of like, just tell people that you're going to do it and then do it. So there was a time where I sort of, sort of shifted what I was posting about on Instagram. And I honestly, like, I just made a post that was like, Hey, everybody, you know, my business is about more than just pretty events. And so now you're going to be hearing from me on a lot of different things. And so here we are. So it's like, I kind of primed them, I think, but I think being intentional and kind of making an announcement for lack of a better word is important because you kind of have to tell people why you're doing it. So it's kind of like, if I wanted to just be doing strictly like great, big, bold, colorful events, like saying, Hey, you know, I took some time to figure out like what really inspires me and I want to get more heavy into the design. And so now I'm focusing on more colorful couples who want to do creative outside the box things. And then you kind of start showing that and whether it's doing like editorials or, you know, showcasing past events that fit that even more specific, um, you continue with that. And so, you kind of have to just be in people's face and like, tell them here's the change I'm making and then follow through with it. I I love that because the thing that I'm thinking about is when people are going to make a change, a lot of times there's confidence issues, right? It's like, I've been so defined by being this. I want to kind of move over and and do something else. Almost like a, what are people going to say? sort of thing. And maybe even the transition that you might've gone through with, you know, being, you're a wedding planner, but now you're an author, you know, now you're, there's so many other, so now there's like hats, you're adding to the hats that you're wearing and to kind of stave off some of the criticism. I love that. And, and, and maybe even making us ourselves more comfortable with that, giving some of these, you know, explanatory posts or things to get your audience ready to say, Hey, I am also passionate, not just about events, but about writing and about educating, about doing all these different things. I love that. Yep. I love that. Well, Leah, for anyone who is interested in checking you out personally, either hiring you or learning from you or picking up your book, um, can you tell everyone your website? Absolutely. It's colorpopevents.com. And then I'm at colorpopevents on social media. So very easy to find. Um, And I do want to add, like, I loved, I'm a super nerd. So I love talking about this stuff. So anybody that's listening that has any follow-up questions or anything, like, please don't hesitate to email me or DM me. Um, I'm 
happy just to chat about this stuff. Perfect. Awesome. Well, everyone, you heard it from Leah today, uh, her book that she just released and the incredible service that she has in our industry. And Leah, really a topic that I don't think a lot of people are touching on. And, you know, with this whole side of weddings and events, this whole emotional side, you know, we, we talk about the strategies and the tactics and the tips and things like that to help increase our business. But there sometimes I think is, is a whole side of that that's left out. So thank you for addressing this and thanks for coming on the show. It's been really, really nice chatting. Yeah, with you. it was so fun chatting with you. 